everyone. Welcome. It's so great to see everyone here to kick off our fall programming. Welcome to Cambia Grove. My name's Maura Little. I am the executive director here at Cambia Grove. We are a healthcare innovation hub focused on bridging the gap between entrepreneurs and the traditional healthcare sectors. We host an open co-working space, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Feel free to drop by. We also have programs like these uh, where we focus on hot topics in healthcare, big, hairy topics that, that we all need to come around together and solve. Today we have a great program where we are going to hear from two national leaders. We're gonna start with Congresswoman Susan Del Bene who represents uh, Washington's first congressional district. Uh, the Congresswoman has a rich history both in technology um, and biotech as well as surveying Washington's congressional district in DC. I've had the great pleasure of working with her um, for a couple of years and I can tell you that she is, uh, does a fantastic job representing us, especially in healthcare technology um, in the nation's capital. So please join me in welcoming the Congresswoman. Good afternoon. It's great to be here, um, and I just want to thank everyone for inviting me and allowing me to join you as we have a conversation about an area that's incredibly important, I think, to every single person in our country, um, and probably the, the most important issue that we talk about when, when folks come into my office, just about health care and what's happening with health care, or about what's not happening with health care, too. Um, I want to thank Cambia Grove for hosting today, and, and Maura and Mike for inviting me to speak. Um, not too long ago, although it's getting longer and longer every day, um, about 20 years ago, um, I would not have been attending today's event as a member of Congress, um, or even probably thinking that I'd ever be attending anything as a member of Congress. Um, but as a leader, as a healthcare um, executive in um, technology, um, where we're trying to disrupt and to innovate, um, in 1998, I helped start up drugstore.com, and um, we thought we were going to, you know, do this kind of simple online platform, um, create a pharmacy, allow consumers access um, to purchase health products, and we partnered with a lot of businesses, and um, the consumer benefit was clear, right? Just make it easier to access and so provide information. Um, you know, I wish 20 years ago we had um, Cambia Grove and others to help us. I think we walked into an environment that was much more complicated um, with a lot more regulatory barriers than we knew as entrepreneurs um, looking at a consumer problem and trying to solve it. And we learned a lot about the complicated landscape that is healthcare today. Um, and so today I was asked to touch on a couple things. One, the federal government's role in spurring healthcare innovation and um, an innovation which is so critical because we are just a hub of innovation right here in our region. And the current conversation around healthcare in DC, which um, probably some of you have a good sense about already because it's been a challenging discussion. Um, so let's first talk about innovation and the federal government. Um, you know, a lot of when we talk about healthcare, a lot of great innovation has started because of investments we made in ba basic research and NIH has really um, been incredible in terms of being the point there. Um, but there are other areas where we're dragging our feet. We can have basic research and learn, but then how do we take those findings and actually turn them into things that actually have an impact on people's lives, uh, make sure people have access um, in our healthcare system. So we have initiatives. Um, there's an initiative right now called Kidney X, um, which is a good example of kind of the forefront of innovation. Um, Kidney X is very new. Um, I'm a co-chair of the Congressional Kidney Caucus. Um, we have a lot of caucuses in, uh, in Congress. And so it's been something that's been really interesting to me and important to our conversation. Um, if you haven't heard of Kidney X, Kidney X is a public-private partnership um, between CMS, the FDA, um, the American Society of Nephrology, and others with the goal of transforming the way that we treat end-stage renal disease which really is one of Medicare's costliest diseases. The partnership is really unique because um, it's not only a commitment of r research dollars, but it's also a commitment from the FDA and from CMS 
to make sure that we expeditiously, and this is important because you know how long the time frames are in healthcare, we expeditiously, expeditiously approve and cover new technologies that come from these re research dollars so that innovators actually have a, a faster ability to get products out to, um, to the community and to patients and that patients benefit from um, these new treatments and that in the end we also bring down the cost for Medicare because we have better outcomes. And if we do all that, that I would say is a win-win-win. Um, but you know, we also have a lot of challenges. This is one example where we're trying to, to move things forward. Um, one of the challenges is the way we look at, um, at policies and the way we kind of look at budgeting from a congressional standpoint. Um, we all know that you put forward a piece of legislation and then it gets a score from the Congressional Budget Office that says how much it's gonna cost. Um, and CBO looks at a 10-year budget window um, when they're determining how much any new legislation will cost the government. And when we look at healthcare innovations and you look at that window, it can be more challenging because there can be a lot of costs up front, something can be very expensive, the window, um, ten, in 10 years you may not see that benefit come through. And so um, if you are you know, looking from a Medicaid or from a government standpoint, um, it's part of the reason why you see that private insurers and Medicaid um, sometimes might embrace innovation, but they can't get it, it can't get to market quickly enough, and you don't always see things that are available in Medicare because they haven't had a chance to, to look at that. The question is, how do we make sure that the CBO, that Medicare, that my colleagues in Congress are forward-looking? And we aren't enough right now. We, are, we have these terrible de political debates about health care, but we aren't very forward-looking in where we're headed. Um, so that we can think about how we would craft healthcare policy so that meaning in meaningful innovations that are happening get to patients in a way that's financially sustainable and quickly. And it's something that I'm very focused on. I think we need to be focused on in the next Congress um, because there's so much great work happening. We're really transforming medicine, but we're only going to be able to see that to fruition if we're smart about how policy, um, how policy deals with this. We need to make sure that Congress is developing policies and federal agencies are relegating or regulating with a look to the future of healthcare, not just the past. We try to throw things in boxes um, that existed already and we don't always look at new innovations and realize that maybe they don't actually fit in a box that already exists. Um, Medicare and Medicaid need to be developing financing policy policies to pay for 21st century innovations in health like precision medicine. The FDA and Medicare need to better coordinate and collaborate so there aren't significant gaps between FDA approval and then Medicare coverage, which can be really tough on a new business. They may not last um, through that gap. Um, because we know that patients deserve to be able to access these innovations and that in many cases they can provide better health outcomes. So now before I talk about the next um, Congress and what I think will happen regarding healthcare changes, um, I, I want to know uh, everyone to know that in November I I demoted my crystal ball um, to a paperweight because I don't think any of us have a good crystal ball right now. But I'll tell you um, when we're talking about the Affordable Care Act and Medicare, I think the Affordable Care Act it kind of foundationally um, is here to stay, and and it should be. We we should be looking at where we're headed, what's working and not working, and instead of saying that was your idea, it was a bad idea, and we need to get rid of it. That's what's happening right now. Where are we at? I, I don't think that the Senate's actually ready to take another swing at the S ACA. We're gonna continue to see legislation um, to try to dismantle the AD ACA. Um, um, and, but we saw in 2017, and we saw it in my office, how advocate, advocates mobilized to protect it across the board. Um, just the number of calls and letters into our offices more than doubled because people were concerned it was gonna happen to their access to healthcare. Um, as for Medicare, I think um, if we win back the majority in e either chamber of Congress, there's gonna be really sincere legislative efforts to stabilize the individual market um, by funding risk corridors, um, reinsurance, expanding premium subsidies to encourage more folks to enter the market, things that we're kind of moving forward but we've moved backward on more recently. 
I also think that um, we could move legislation to expand access to Medicare. Um, mostly take the form of something like Medicare buy-in, where some folks could, could buy in, or, um, or uh, a, a type of public option. But um, those are details that we need to work out. We need to have hearings. We need to bring people in. We need to learn um, so we can put forward policies that really are going to deliver the best opportunities for people across the country. Um, while I'm here, I also want to talk about macro implementation and our shift as we look towards value, uh, value-based health care. Um, as many of you know, in 2015, Congress restructured how we pay clinicians to treat Medicare patients with the goal of getting higher quality and lower costs. And we can only do that if providers have the tools and the data to change the way they care for patients. And data is critical here because if we're going to talk about what value we're getting, we need to be able to measure that and understand that. And there's a huge amount uh, that's going to happen with data and healthcare. And you, you are all kind of in the center of that. But when we talk about value-based care, that's also critical. So I'm um, getting these tools to more providers. Um, you know, I just hope that folks can join me in making sure that Congress continues to, to move Medicare and the healthcare system towards one of value and innovation. So um, thanks again so much for having me. I know I'd love to have a conversation, and I'm happy to answer questions or just get your feedback on your answers on what you think we need to be working on. So um, let's open it up. and. Um, we have time for two questions. Thank you for being here, Congresswoman Delbany. I'm Rhonda Curry with the Washington State Hospital Association, and I just want to thank you for your support of health care. We represent all of the hospitals and health systems across the state. So our members tell us, as you mentioned, value-based payments leading into innovation, fundamentally with support of fair and strong reimbursement for providers will allow us to continue in this work. And also, one of the less Sparkly component of innovation is patient safety. And we are a CMS contractor and doing an incredible work on the ground across the state in these 207 hospitals to keep patients safer. And the results are quite compelling. So um, we'll be in touch with you in the future, but we, we really appreciate your support of all of the CMS members. Thank you. Hi, this is Sadek Chitani. So you, what happens if there is no change of control in Congress? What do you think our health care system is going to look like uh, three years out? Well, I worry a lot. I worry that, again, um, we need to be talking about what's working, what's not working. We need to do pilots and try things. I talked about Kidney X. Um, let's try uh, ideas out and see what works and what criteria they work under so that we know how that impacts national policy and what we should be doing. Um, really, the disappointing thing for me, especially this Congress, has been kind of these ongoing efforts to dismantle the Affordable Care Act without any sense of where we would go instead. Um, what does a future look like? The fact that we have folks who are terrified that they're going to lose coverage for pre existing conditions, that's the health care conversation we're having right now. Um, the fact that Young people are, again, moving back to plans where the, they have high deductibles and they don't feel like they can afford primary care anymore. We were moving in, a, ac in the opposite direction, and that it hasn't been that long that we've seen uh, this movement backwards. So, like I said, the beginning of this Congress, when kind of the conversation came up about repealing the Affordable Care Act, the number of calls and letters and emails and communications, and not just into my office, but into congressional offices across the country, more than doubled. And it was almost all because of health care. And it was all st personal stories. And these are very personal stories of people saying why um, either the Affordable Care Act has made a huge difference in the life of their family, where they were, um, where they are now a mother whose um, son, who young son has hemophilia and she needs drugs for him every single day, expensive medication for him every single day. They used to worry about, her and her husband used to worry about changing a job 
for fear that if they changed a job, they would lose health care coverage for their son. Um, and they couldn't afford to medications that he needs to live. And that's just one of story after story after story. So it's a huge conversation, obviously, across the country right now as we look at an election because it's something that people are very, very, very concerned about. But I do worry that if we aren't being um, – if we, we don't have a goal of making sure that everyone in our country has affordable quality health care, then, um, then we're in a place where we could see basic health care protections continue to be undermined. And that means more and more people using the ER as their only form of health care, um, waiting till the last minute before they have access. And that would be a terrible thing for our communities across the board. Well, we've had these debates in Congress already. You can actually go look at the debates we had on the health care bill, even in our committee. It was never about what we're going to do going forward. If you think that we should have coverage for pre-existing conditions, if you think that children should be able to stay on their parents' plan until they're 26, if you think that we should not have lifetime caps, then you don't need to repeal that. That's there, so let's agree that that's there and talk about what we else we might need to do. Instead, there's this constant idea that because it's your idea, it must be bad, and we need to get rid of it. And the, the really kind of sad thing underneath is that actually a lot of the, the kind of the basic ideas some that were implemented in the Affordable Care Act actually were Republican ideas. <laughs> um, um, and so why this became so partisan um, is heartbreaking. I wasn't there when the Affordable Care Act passed, but I know we should all be looking at what's working, what's not working today, and talk about what we can do to continue to deal with new innovation, to make sure that we continue to work towards that goal of everyone having affordable quality health care in our country. That's what we should be doing. That is not what we're doing, and um, it's a huge concern and should be a huge concern for all of us because it impacts every single one of us. We can take one more question. My name is Suzanne Sherlock, and I'm a product manager at a new um, health insurance startup. And we are utilizing blockchain technology to maximize efficiencies in the system. And I just wanted to know, what's your platform on supporting health innovations like blockchain to make healthcare better? And what do you think that Congress in the upcoming election cycle is going to be favorable to supporting new innovations like this? So. Um, I kind of have it. I'll, I'll start at the high level. What I would love to see, and, and some of us were talking about this just a minute ago, given everything that we know right now in terms of healthcare and, ter and everything we know about technology and what's available, what would we do today? If we didn't have the constraints of the system that we have today, what would an ideal system look like today? And can we, can we talk about that? We can talk about how hard it would be to get there, but I'd love to do the kind of clean slate exercise and say, what does that look like? Because then we can start to talk about how we might get there, um, not talk about kind of barriers. And I also am a huge believer in pilots. I think we should try things. You know, I talked about QDX, but pilots across the board should try things out to see if they work the way we expect them to, um, to understand where they work, where they don't work, um, maybe certain populations that things work for. Um, because that would inform federal policy, and if we are going to be forward-looking, we should be willing to try those things and learn from them. And I'm also, you know, I'm a scientist by training, and I believe in data and, and science and facts, and I think that can help inform us, and pilots and, and investments in research help us get there. So at the highest level, we talk about any type of new innovation. The question is, how can we try and learn? How do we measure things? And, and and w understand what success might look like, and then how do we extend and apply that going forward? Right now, like I said, there isn't a lot of look in terms of wh how we, where we head in the future, um, but if we could do kind of that clean slate type of exercise, I think we'd have a real conversation about how we might move towards that and, um, and take all sorts of new ideas into account and understand how we might um, look at those going forward. Go ahead, we'll do one. Okay, okay, sorry. 
I'll keep going, and then I'm going to make um, a lot of people unhappy with me. So um, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. So much, Congresswoman, and thank you so much for your service and leadership uh, on these on these big issues. So next up, we um, are looking forward to having a conversation uh, via under the bows with Lee Huntsman. And as Lee and Mike come up on stage and get settled, um, I'm going to give a couple of thank yous and uh, set the stage for for the second half of our program. So under the bows is a program that we, uh, that we partner with UW BioEngage on. And we are fortunate to have Lee Huntsman, pre President Emeritus of the University of Washington, join us basically every month uh, to discuss big uh, issues in healthcare, thought leadership in healthcare, and what we can do uh, moving forward. This month, we are fortunate to have Mike Copel join us for this version of Under the Bows, where we're focusing on a customer-centric healthcare experience. Mike uh, recently served as Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Nordstrom's and is currently the Board Chair of Cambia Health Solutions, a 100-year-old health national health solutions company working to transform the healthcare system towards a more person-centric, economically sustainable healthcare system. So please join me in welcoming both Mike and Lee on stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Mike, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You know, I can't help commenting that I found the Congresswoman's remarks really encouraging, just to find that clarity of thinking and the forward orientation coming from Congress. Very encouraging. And, you know, her remarks, especially her, her endorsement of pilots, made me think of that interview with Jeff Bezos that appeared in Truth Wires Journal, where he distinguishes between operational excellence and innovation. And all, every organization knows itself and is trying to do both. Mm -hmm. And he points out that it can have different criteria. I mean, and innovation requires experiments, and experiments mean you need to allow for failure. And what, one of the things that Representative Delvinney said that was attitudinal shift that she perceives in places like the FDA to try and be faster and so forth. But we can certainly use some political support for the notion of, of experiments. And historically, we have a, we need them, and yet when many things fail, we beat the people up pretty badly. And, and so if you get a chance, I encourage your civic leaders the spirit of innovation and experimentation. What do you think? What do you think? Well, I believe, believe that you don't learn anything unless either you make a mistake or you fail. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you knew what you were doing and you did it right, obviously you knew what you were doing. There was no learning there. So I, I, I think it's just a natural progression of whether it's individuals or organizations um, bettering themselves. Um, I agree with you, there are some cultures, you know, in organizations, in any organizations, business, politics, sports, where, you know, the culture has a very low tolerance for people who uh, don't succeed the first time around. Um, but there's a lot of very successful cultures that, um, that, that feel otherwise. And, um, and, they're, and they're learning communities, and I think that's, that's critical. It's interesting you, when you were talking about the uh, test and learn. In the business I came from, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as I would say scientific as as healthcare. But you know, we would test all the time whether people liked what we were selling. I mean, we didn't just go out and buy five million dollars worth of product and put it out there and cross our fingers. Um, we would test it. We would test it. Now, fortunately. You know, and today there's so many ways you can test it. You can test it in a physical location. You can test it online. You know, a lot of e-commerce companies, I don't know if many of you are aware of this, but um, different people have different experiences on websites. There are multiple versions of websites that are testing whether or not customers like to shop this way or like to shop that way. So I think the whole innovation and test is not just for healthcare, it's for any 
any, any um, situation where you're trying to improve yourself. Well, it's clear that you've come to this with some experience, but let's tell people, who are you? Uh, what, <laughs> what, what is your background? I don't uh, what's the professional journey been? Who am I? Um, m many of you might be able to tell that I'm not a West Coaster. Some people say they can hear something in my voice. I'm a native New Englander. I grew up in Connecticut. Uh, lived in Boston before we moved out to Seattle. Uh, my family and I moved out to Seattle 18 years ago to join Nordstrom. My, uh, my business background is, uh, you know, having started in public accounting, I found myself in the retail industry. Um, what attracted me is I just was very um, energized by the energy of the people and the competitiveness of the environment. Uh, in our industry, very different from what the Congresswoman talked about and what we're talking about in healthcare, things happen really fast. You get feedback really fast. Um, we used to get the sales, I, mean, I used to look at the sales every hour. I could, I, I'd know how business was by the hour. So, you know, we were constantly, uh, there was all this energy and competitiveness as to how we're doing against the other guy. And so I was really attracted to it. Um, and and the majority of my career, I came up through finance and operations in the retail industry. I became CFO of Nordstrom in 2001, and through that journey, um, had a number of different responsibilities. Uh, um, you know, everything from what I would say is the um, traditional core elements of a CFO. Uh, we had a credit card business. We had a loyalty program. I got very involved in all our technology decision making. Um, there was a number of things. So I, I've, I've had an interesting track, and about eight, nine years ago, I got a call about um, joining this board. I joined this board in 2009, and I was very, um, I, I'll use the word energized again, because I only do things that excite me. Um, I was very energized by the vision of the management team. At that time, it was Regents, now it's Cambia, in terms of um, their, their just passion to change what was going on in healthcare. And being that I thought, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, domestically it's probably our most significant policy issue that we face for our generation and for future generations. I thought if there was a small way that I could be part of that and contribute, um, I would love to do that. So here we are. Let's, let's go into that a little bit further. Uh, the Congresswoman used the very diplomatic phrase to say that healthcare mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well, in prior sessions, though, under the bowels, we've re referred to it as a qualm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it, how, tell us a little bit about your entry into this complicated environment and, and your sense of uh, uh, what's possible mm -hmm. and uh, what are the constraints. What, what's your learning curve been like? Sure. Well, first place, I, I, when you look at healthcare, like you look at anything that, that um, has evolved over time, I, you know, I don't think we can sit here and blame anybody and point fingers. That would be unproductive, okay? I, if you look at the history of healthcare and, and, and the way it's been exchanged between a buyer and seller over time, it's evolved. I mean, there was a time well over 100 years ago that it was a, a traditional buy-sell relationship. You had something wrong with you, you went to the doctor. If you didn't have money, you barter. You know, you give them a horse, a cow, or whatever. And that's how you got health care. And then, you know, actually Regents was part of the initial first to have community health care because it was, it was recognized that as a community we wanted to take care of each other and some of us didn't have the same resources as others. So insurance started and then post-World War II, employers started offering insurance as a benefit. And that created a whole other dynamic. And that dynamic was all of a sudden um, the, uh, the customer became the employer because someone was selling a product to the employer. And then in 1965, you had Medicare and Medicaid, okay? And then all of a sudden, the government gets involved. So then you have everything that goes along with the government interaction. And then, of course, now we have the complexities of the fact that um, research and development is accelerating cures. We have personalized medicine. We have... Um, I would say economically more accessible data. Um, while it's accessible because of historical reasons, it's, it's difficult. So I think amongst all that, you know, you start to see that the complexity we're dealing with is not, you know, something, you know, uh, to blame, but perhaps um, an opportunity for us to find 
solutions and to demonstrate that those solutions can work so others could adapt them. And I, you know, I think when Mark and his team were looking to rearrange their board, they brought people like me on and others who had uh, more, you know, came from retail backgrounds or consumer-oriented backgrounds, where, where we could get back to that basic relationship of a buyer and a seller or a provider and a, and a recipient of service. We got the benefit of that service. Well, you've been inside this tent now for a little while. Uh, nine years. Nine years. Yeah. And uh, from talking with you, I know you have some observations, but mm -hmm. also a premise uh, built on your background about what might happen in healthcare. Why don't you expand on sure. that? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is one of the um, frameworks that I continue to hear as um, healthcare providers talk about those that are receiving healthcare is they call. Um, they call their customers consumers, or they call us consumers, all right? And one of the things I learned, and I guess formed my own opinions over the years, is consumers are people you transact with, customers are people you build a relationship with. And when you build a relationship with someone you're doing business with or, or giving service to, it tends to have a much more long-term uh, view to it. Um, you know, you know, consumer uh, consumerism to me is all about: Do I offer the cheapest thing, and do I create a transaction? Do I sell a big insurance policy to an employer, and then all of a sudden I have business, and then three, four years from now they go out and they and they try to sell it again, and someone undercuts them, and then there's lower benefits, and and that's what happens. So you haven't really developed that customer relationship. All you're doing is consummating transactions. So I, you know, I think one of the things I did see is that we need to get back to that basic premise of, um, uh, of a provider and a customer uh, relationship. Because if we get there, then we will be, I think, more in tune to being able to provide that benefit because that customer potentially could have choice. And today, there's not a lot of choice, so there's not a lot of incentive to try to create a differentiated experience. So, okay, the idea is that healthcare could learn some things from retail. Mm -hmm. about how to think about who your customer is right. uh, and, and how to relate to them and how to sustain that relationship over time. Uh, let's, let's dissect that a bit. What, what does the retail sector do along those lines to identify, understand, and cultivate a customer? What, what are the principles that you think we might learn? Sure. From? Well, clearly uh, there's a couple principles. One um, is you have to have a product that, that uh, from the customer's perspective has value, okay? Too many times, um, you know, you know there, are, there are multiple versions of retailing out there. There's the one where value is, is purely derived by price, and that's kind of where we are with healthcare. We derive value purely on who's gonna deliver the cheapest solution, the lowest premium, et cetera, et cetera. There's also the value proposition that says, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a really good solution that's going to have a long-term benefit for me. And, what, and whether it's that I've chosen to participate in some sort of program that ensures that um, I may not contract a certain disease because, uh, because I'm involved in some sort of preventative activity, whether it's exercise, whether it's uh, diet, um, anything that would, that would assure that you're not going to be just a transactor going forward, but, but that you're going to have derived real benefit because you're going to be healthy. And the ultimate benefit that we offer in healthcare is wellness. Um, someone, someone said something to me, and you know, I think you even asked in your questions, um, is the result going to be a happy, you know, a happy person? Well, to me, if you're healthy, you're usually happy. Um, uh, it, at least that works for me. I know when I'm not feeling well, I'm pretty nasty. Um, but when I'm feeling well, I'm pretty nice. So I'm feeling well today, folks. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so you know, I, I, I think being able to, to have that relationship where there is a definite understanding that I'm deriving benefit and I have a choice in the situation, that I have control of the situation, that I'm a, empowered to do something about the situation. Um, and that's and that's the re you know I, as a as a retailer, 
if we didn't deliver great product and deliver product that people couldn't get someplace else and, and make it easy for people, you know, in today's world, the signature of, of a great, you know, experience is speed and convenience. That's what Amazon said, right? I mean, everything's about speed and convenience. Um, and, and we ought to be able to do that in healthcare. Today, I don't think you would describe your healthcare experience as quick and easy, right? And so I think those are some of the things we can learn. And part of it, 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 it is very complicated. You know, medicine is very complicated, and I think those that, that are very close to it, you know, I always found, and I found it in my industry, I found it with all the financial people I used to deal with on Wall Street, the closer you are to something, the more complicated you make it. And I think part of our job is it's complicated to make things easy, it's easy to make things complicated. And part of our job is to figure out how to make a relatively complicated um, endeavor like, like uh, dealing with your own personal health care easier for the customer. Well, that sounds attractive. Uh, it's going to take a long time, though. It, 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 <laughs> it's not only complicated, there are a bunch of reality factors pushing back. Mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, what have you done in health care? We've mostly organized it around the perceived scarce resource. Right, which mm -hmm. is either physician time or beds or some scarce and expensive resource. So, uh, you tell me you want uh, quick and easy uh, and customer centric. Uh, how's that going to work? How, how how can we do that within bounds of the reality of the system? Well, I think the first thing we all have to accept is the fact that um, we are here today. And I think in my initial comments, I, try, I tried to allude to it. We are here today um, as a result of a variety of forces and factors that have, been, that have taken us about 125 or so years to get here. So we're not going to change this thing overnight. I, I, I think there's a lot of cultural changes that are necessary. But I do think that part of what you're talking about is because the healthcare system as it exists today tends to be very transaction oriented. I'm sick. I need a treatment, okay? I have an issue, I need surgery. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is because individuals primarily um, generally don't understand um, help, you know, their own needs for health and how to empower themselves to improve their health. And so I think giving, giving them the tools, one of the things we're trying to do with Cambia is to develop the tools and the transparency so people can have a little bit more accountability and control over their health care and to make choices. The challenge today, because the way the system exists, you don't have a lot of flexibility to make choices. So I do think that over time, um, given, and, and I think the Congresswoman implied to it, and, and there was a question, I think your question about um, personalized data and using blockchain for that. Um, I do think that, that that's a classic example where we have not empowered um, ourselves as customers or patients because we don't own our own health care. I mean, isn't it, isn't it kind of odd that you have to beg to see the results of a test or, or to see your, you know, your historical uh, notes that a doctor took on you from an exam? I mean, that should be something you own and something that travels with you. So I do think those concepts is what we learned from that. Now, how we get there is the complexity. Are you aware of any experiments that have been done out there that maybe model how this could be? Are, are the concierge practices a model of what you're talking about? Um, well, I think that's an element of it. Um, I, you know, I'll give an example of something we've been working on at Cambia for several years, and we're going to continue to work on and invest in. Um, uh, you know, we have our own internal word for it. It's called seamless. But the idea is to be able to uh, give, um, give our customers a tool that allows them to have transparency into cost of care, into, into how they feel about uh, the quality of the care they're getting from an individual provider. Um, some of them, how to finance, because in today's world, um, as you know, uh, not a, lot of, um, a lot of things are not 100% covered by your insurance. You know, as, as the whole economics have led into this, um, and we've tried to put more of the accountability onto the customer or the patient, what's happened is the cost has gone up for them. Because the world of don't worry about it, insurance will pay for it, you know, resulted in a, just a cost level and economics that didn't make sense. 
So what we're trying to do is offer these kind of solutions to, to our patients and customers that allows them um, to hopefully have a little bit more control over that process and not be so um, blinded by, um, by the framework. Great. I don't see the clock yet, but I, I, I've been, maybe I've been sitting on this job too long. This, um, you, you mentioned the, the, the phrase culture change. Mm -hmm. This is the land of the five Ps, right? We got patients, yeah, but we got providers, we got payers, mm -hmm. we got purchasers, yep. and we got policymakers, right? And we got all of these constituents. Everybody with a stake in this system, all with different cultures, different expectations, different incentives, uh, both financial and otherwise. And it, it's a it's a land of uh, contention in many ways, and so. From your perspective, either individually or on the you know, these boards, uh, do you see any coalescence of agendas that can move us in this direction? You know, cultural change is something that doesn't happen overnight. Um, I, I, it, let me just share an experience I had about 20 some odd years ago at another large retailer. Um, we, we, we as a company recognized and our customers told us that, boy, you know, you guys are brutal. I mean, your customer service is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. So we brought in one of the top strategic consulting firms to help us figure out how we can become you know, nicer and more friendly to our customers. And, and they actually came up, came up with this program called Friendly, Friendliness. It was called Friendliness. And, and the whole idea is after somebody shopped with us, they had to fill out these little index cards and they, and they rated their experience, and they also told us, you know, who that, um, what department it was in, and something like that. The bottom line is, we tried to legislate that behavior, and you can't legislate that behavior. And and cultural change comes from leadership, and and, and it and it comes from um, co you know constant reminder of what our what our purpose is, what our uh, what our north star is, and. And that's going to take time. Now, I will say what I've seen in Cambia, the leadership in Cambia has been incredibly focused on creating that customer-centric uh, point of view. Uh, it's very easy in large organizations, and even the organization I came from, which I think a lot of folks uh, know as a bellwether for customer service, I got to tell you, it's tough. Um, you have stores that, um, uh, you know, that have a certain point of view as to how to serve the customer. You have e-commerce folks, how to serve the customer. You have the finance people who say it costs too much. You have the HR people say, you know, you're working these people too hard, you're not saying the right things to them. I mean, so you have all these little functions coming together because in large enterprises, people tend to behave based on the function that they operate in. And so the only way to create that culture is through leadership and constantly reminding people that everything we're doing is not necessarily for your division or your department, it's for the customer. Um, and so I think as it relates to healthcare, it's going to take a long time, a long time. Yeah. You know, I've had people tell me, or people who should know, that there's something in the water in the Northwest. They claim that both Nordstrom's and Costco have a history of taking people from the Northwest to new stores elsewhere in order to establish a, a consumer, a customer-centric mm -hmm. culture. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but do you, th do you think, is, is this prime country for the transition you're talking about? Well, I'll tell you, when I moved out here from Boston, I noticed a definite difference in, the, in, in, in my own customer experience. <laughs> um, I think there is something in the water. When you look at, at here in the Northwest, look at the unbelievably successful customer-centric companies we have here. You, uh, you, uh, you mentioned Nordstrom's and Costco, but you mentioned Starbucks. And even Amazon, I mean, Amazon, which is, which is this huge mass merchant, is all about delivering a great customer experience. It's a different kind of one. It's all about speed and convenience. Um, but I do think there is um, there is something to learn um, from that perspective. Okay, so you have before you here a collection of folks that are interested in innovation in healthcare. Yep. Uh, they got uh, technical entrepreneurs, they got providers uh, that are trying to scope and move forward. And, and, and I have even a scatter of scattering of policy-oriented folks. What advice do you have? As, if you want to see things move in this direction, as 
you have suggestions for that? Well, I think the first thing I would say is, you know, keep in mind why we're doing all this and who we're doing it for. You know, um, we're not doing it. Um, we're not doing it for our own self-interest. We're not doing it for you know a certain goal we may have uh, in our in our division or organization. We're doing this for you know for the individual um, who needs health care or or who we want to express upon them and start to embrace when they're very young wellness. Um, so I, you know I think the first thing is to is to consider is what are we doing to make that person's experience better and to create a better, um, and to create an improved well-being for them and their loved ones. You know, I can't help remembering Jim Kimmigold's professor, Dick Rich, called it uh, in his tussles with Wall Street. He said his perspective was that if he did right by his customers and his mm -hmm. employees, mm -hmm. then his investors would turn out better. Well, I got to tell you, one of the great things about being here in the Northwest, when I used to go back and, you know, I, I was in New York usually five plus times a year dealing with investors and going to analyst mm -hmm. meetings and things like that. It was great spending two or three days there and getting all that noise and then escaping back here and focusing on the customers. I do think that is one of the benefits that we do have out here. Um, while, while I believe our system is a fabulous system, it funds innovation. It separates the winners from the, those that don't win. Um, that's all good because we need to do that. But I do think um, some of that short-termism plays against the ability to think long-term. And I think when it comes to healthcare, and the Congresswoman brought it up, you know, in business, we tend to think long-term as you know, even three to five years. You know, she said that the 10-year framework um, in Washington doesn't even work for healthcare. Because some of the investments you make are beyond that. They're generational. If, if you think a generation is 25 to 30 years, then the investments you make are not going to play out over a 10-year period. And you have to be courageous enough and bold enough to know that this is the right thing to do and it's going to benefit the long term. OK. Call to courage and boldness. Perfect. Time how's, for you all to step up to the microphone and pummel Mike with your question. Oh, wow. Good. Here, let's start here. Love it. So, uh, hi, my name is Sebastian. I just finished a PhD in innovation and business strategy and I focus on healthcare. Well, nice so to meet I you. have a question for you. You mentioned Amazon. Yes. And um, we had talked earlier with the congressman about innovation coming out from different areas. So, in Seattle, you have Amazon uh, putting together a collaboration with Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan mm -hmm. to disrupt the, inno uh, the insurance business. Uh, what's well, healthcare. Healthcare business. Healthcare, yeah. What's what's your take on that? And uh, do you see the market change making the changes necessary to pull innovation and healthcare in different directions? Sure. Well, I I think that's a great call to action. Um, I you know those those three companies. I mean, clearly, because of the leadership of those three companies, they have a very very loud voice. Okay, and so I think that's a real positive. I believe the combination of those three institutions is roughly a million people. So. That's a nice population to try things on. Um, I do think that part of what those folks were trying to accomplish is to send a signal that we're not happy with how things are working and we're going to try to do something to perhaps find a better way. So I think it's great. You know, I mean, we're doing things at Cambia. You know, we serve, you know, roughly two million people and with our and with our venture capital businesses and some of the um, companies, you know, we, ser we touch a lot more folks and we're trying things. And so I think that's just another example of, um, you know, jumping in the pool and seeing what you can learn from that. I think it's great. All right, next question. Hi, uh, I'm Mary. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively new to the personal uh, health care field because I also come from the retail industry. I worked for Kohl's department stores and then after that I worked for Brooks Brown and Company. So I worked I worked in corporate. Um, so this is a, an apology in, in case that this question is really naive. Uh, <laughs> but oh, so w I love this conversation on the focus on having a scientific mindset and related to it too about focusing on, on, on data and measurement and 
find pilots and drones. But all of the data and the numbers and the measurements don't matter unless you have a clear and specific vision of what success is and what health is. And that's where I see a glaring problem is that we don't really have a full picture of what is a truly healthy person, not just their disease. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that you, you called it wellness. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, if you, do you feel like we're very clear and uh, full on, on that definition of wellness, or do you feel like there, there's a gap that needs there to, to improve our understanding of, of what health is? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, have, I have a lot of strong opinions on it, but I'm <laughs> curious. I bet you do. You, do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think one, uh, a couple of metrics that have come to light that I think have opened people's eyes is that we spend more money per capita in this country on health care than any other country around the world, and, and our expected lifespan is lower than many countries. So just those two points of view suggest that maybe you know, the system isn't as efficient or productive as it could be. So I think that's one thing. Um, I do think there needs to be uh, some more clarity. Just as an aside, I'm currently reading this book, Dreamland, which is about the opioid epidemic here in the US, and one of the things it talks about is one of the um, causes of the epidemic is a number of years ago, the medical community added pain into the measurement of wellness. And so as a result of that, you know, people would go into an exam and say, oh, are you in pain? Yeah, my, you know, and then, and it was a one to 10 thing, right? And yeah, I'm an eight, okay, I'm gonna give you this. Okay, and so that's one of the things that was talked about. So my point is sometimes metrics create unintended consequences. And so I think you really have to understand what you're trying to do. But I think those first two things I, I mentioned are indicative of a, um, of a system that probably could be working better. And I would mention too that while at the individual level, population level is a huge problem. Some of the guests we've had here last year was Taiwan Jamison, a cell pharmacist with the what's called IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. It is astounding what they have achieved in terms of granular data on the state of health in our region mm -hmm. across the board. And, and they're accelerating that. And so one of the things that's happening with those metrics of our population health very rapid and that that goes into out the door and that uh, puts in Wuhan and that very much uh, affects the population so some of the stuff that's already working is being done let's take another question hey Mike thank Hi. you uh, Jacob Miller from Amazon Web Services actually and, and ironically worked with both Cambia and Nordstrom in my time um, so one question I had for you is when you're looking at customer centric I think the parallels are really interesting when yeah. you're looking especially from the technology side at, at retail and healthcare. But when you're looking at customer-centric healthcare, um, how do you scale effectively when you're looking at going after customers? I mean, when you look at going through health plans and big employers, you can add scale so easily. But with different plans in every state and different, you know, different EMR systems on the back end and all these different things that you have to connect into, how do you scale effectively with things like Seamless that we're working with as well? Yeah, well, I think that goes back to the fundamental question as to who owns the information. You know, and do we have, do we have a health, uh, you know, a medical record that travels with us? Um, because you're absolutely right. You know, I know the challenge we'd have when we decide, like, you know, oh my God, you know, we're going to go to a different processor of our credit card, and it takes, you know, two years and twenty-two million dollars to go through that chain, so everybody could map the old fields to the new fields and test it and make sure all the information was accurate. Okay, and then we, you know, change another enterprise system, and that was another twenty-five million for whoever came in and told us they could help us, um, and that was very complicated. But then you talk about healthcare, right? And you know, that's th there's so much more data that goes around that, and so much more data that lives with the individual. That I think that's where we need to come to grips with, you know, who's who's going to own and who's going to help us decide how we develop that individual's medical record. So that would be my answer. And thank you for all you do with AWS. Next question. 
Hi, I'm Allison, and I work for IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And I work with organizations that want access to our estimates on population health. So I'm looking at more of like a B2B relationship in the customer-centric sense, but ultimately looking at the end yeah, sure. customer and wellness. How do you differentiate the approach to customer-centric you in the kind of B2B versus B2C world? Or is there any? Um, I, let me make sure I understand your question. So, so you're asking, you know, how do, we, how do we look at the value of data being exchanged business to business versus business to customer? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I, first place, in serving individuals, you need to have B2B relationships, right? Because not every enterprise is gonna have uh, the wherewithal, the knowledge, um, the background to develop everything themselves. Okay, you know, I, I, I think one of the things I know I personally learned as we accelerated all our technology investment is um, you're naive and arrogant to think that you can develop everything yourself, okay? that there are much smarter people out there who know how to do certain things much better than you. And so then what you need to do is you gotta go out and get those solutions. And so I think that's where the B2B comes in, okay? The B2C comes in, you know, those are the things that, that you understand about your customer, that you have that intimate relationship with your customer, that generally you wanna have more control out of that as, as to how you manage that relationship. So I, th I think it's kind of two different things there, if, if you follow me. Um, what I've seen in most enterprises, particularly enterprises that deal with directly with consumers slash customers, is they tend to develop the technology that interacts with their customer. They buy the technology that supports most of the infrastructure and transaction processing, if that makes sense. I'll take the next question back here. Hi, my name is uh, Norris Kamo. I'm a primary care physician at Virginia Mason. Um, and we've done a lot of um, you know, innovations to try to make our product customer-centric. We have open notes. You can read your notes. You can read your radiology notes. Yep. We have our patient portal. You can interact with us. Um, but we always, you know, medicine and healthcare run into the ceiling, right, in terms of what you can expect from healthcare. So, you know, there's patients that come in. I've had a concussion. Uh, I have an interview tomorrow. Can I get better by tomorrow? And the answer is no, right? <laughs> Sometimes it takes six months to yeah, sure. recover. Sure. You know, I, I broke my back, right? Uh, okay, you didn't uh, fracture your spine. It's going to take six weeks. So how do we try to meet the customer's demand but also reset expectations when we kind of hit that ceiling in terms of what we're able to offer? Wow. Wow, that's a great question. I mean, you know, unless you get one of those little healing things they had on Star Trek, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you because, I mean, basically, basically what it is is you need to educate your patient, you know, help, help to educate your patient. I mean, I, I, that, that's the complexity I in our business. Like when we talk about speed and convenience, what I was trying to um, uh, articulate is the fact that when you do have that interaction, um, you, you know, your ability to have that interaction and the ease of having that interaction versus, versus the solution. As you know, as a physician, part of the issues we may have with some of, you know, is that people looking for the quick fix, right? And, and, and part of that, you know, is our ability to um, help our patients understand that there is no quick fix for certain things. I hate that. I mean, I'm not a doctor. That's the best I could come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for three more questions, and I know that this is a room full of questions. Love it. So we're going to do three more, and then um, Mike and Lee are going to stick around for some networking afterwards. Yes. Great. Mike, great talk. Lee, always great. Um, Charlie Corridor, technology is entrepreneur. Uh, I work for a late-stage startup medical device trying to improve healthcare. So the question for you um, that Lee touch is, you know, healthcare is based on three Ps and the five Ps, right? Yes. I want to talk about the two of them, patient and payers, right? How technology are improving that relationship between the outcome of the patient and what the payers are willing to pay for the outcome? So that's kind of the value-based management thing? Yeah. 
Um, well, that's, uh, you know, I think that's something that over time where hopefully data will help us give a better answer. Um, because the only way I think we can, we can start to really create that uh, value-based um, situation is, is, to, is to have an open enough market to know what value-based is. You know, in certain other industries, you know, there's open markets, and, and the markets can, by their very notion, define, you know, what value is and what one person is willing to pay for something. Um, you know, pr the problem with healthcare, and you know, uh, because because of all these parties and the way it's evolved over time, is the insurance companies will tend to go in and bid on new work, and the way they bid is they say, "I can deliver this to you, and it's only going to cost you this, and you're only going to, you know, it's only going to cost the company this, and it's only going to cost your employees this." Well, then within that, you know, they ratchet down the providers and get them to agree on certain prices for um, certain procedures. Well, that's not really based on a market. You know, I mean, I mean, that's not based on a buyer and seller agreeing that I'm willing to pay this for that because, because there's market information. Yeah. You mean you mean what the what that what the fair market value is for that service? Oh, uh, no, he's talking about speeding up adoption. Oh, I see. Sneaking another so one in talking, there. So you're talking from the perspective of an entrepreneur trying to kickstart your business. Oh, now I get it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it, look at you know it's it's like any new product. I mean, you have to get it out there and you have to get accept you know acceptance and and you have to prove that it's going to create value. I mean, I don't have a magic pill for you on that one. Anybody anybody who develops a new product goes through that agita of you know is it are people going to accept it? Do I have the right price, et cetera? So I mean, hey, you're an entrepreneur, dude. Deal with it. <laughs> Nick, you're up. I'll take one more question. Back here. Hi, my name's Greg. I'm an ER doctor at Swedish. Um, I have a question for you about a recent study that came out. Just curious to get your reaction where people looked at Yelp reviews and correlated it to hospital compare reviews, which is hospital compare is a publicly reported database with patient outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and what they find was there was very little correlation between the customer-centric reviews and the actual reported patient outcomes, such that I think 20% of the hospitals that were most highly rated on Yelp by their customers actually had the worst outcomes in hospital compare. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what what is your advice putting on your Nordstrom's hat, which yeah. everybody admires for what a great job Nordstrom's does serving its customers. What is your advice to hospitals and providers who have really limited, or you know, have limited resources? How much do we invest in a Yelp review, and how much do we invest in, you know, patient outcomes, and what actually matters? Yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, one of the things I was amazed when I when I first joined the company is how much time was spent. Um, that that the store managers all the way up to the to the guys whose last name started with N would read customer letters. I mean, they, it, it was you know I said God, you guys have time for that. I said, well, this is what we do. And by the way, our biggest the biggest value in our brand was the service component. And the, and and it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to measure in a very binary way. You know, service is good based on the fact that usually people give you positive re reviews. One of the things about some of the um, portals that you mentioned or channels that you mentioned is certain ones, only people who are complaining tend to go on. Um, you usually, in a lot of that stuff, um, people who generally have pretty good experiences sometimes don't have the same energy to whine about it than people have bad experiences. I'm just throwing that out. Um, and you, it, but but you have to respect that, and you have to acknowledge that, and you have to find what you believe is is the most credible view of what your customers are saying about you. 
I would not ignore, you know, you have to listen to everybody because even the ones that may have those negative and come across more negative have something to say and there's clearly something that you can do better. So, uh, I, I mean, you only get better by listening to that. Um, but, y you know, sometimes folks only like to hear the good news. Well, you guys rated us high, we're not gonna listen to you. Don't ignore that stuff. That, that would be the one thing I would recommend because you'll learn a lot from that. We're gonna sneak in one more question. Hey, Mike. Hi. I'm Marco. Um, I've been entrenched in healthcare for about over 20 years. I'm not going to stand because I don't want to block the audience behind me. Uh, and I love the uh, statement that you made about the consumer you transact with and, and the customer you want to build a relationship with. Yeah. And so I'm going to provide my experience to you and ask you a question. Myself as a patient, when I go to my primary care physician or the hospital or for certain issue that I need to deal with, I love to be treated uh, as a customer, the relationship, the experience for sure. But when I leave that space, colors are blending between the customer centricity and the consumerization, meaning I have everything on my phone, apps, information, like you said, I want to own my information. So the question to you is how do you think uh, is the expectation going forward as we focus more on the customer, the customer centric part? that also we're gonna blend it with the consumerization because it's expected that as I leave, I want that transactional information and connection with my healthcare piece, space, via apps, via information, via uh, automation, guidance, uh, warnings, right? All these things that help me, but in a transactional way. Yeah, well, y Thank you for the question. I, you know, uh, just to clarify my definition of a transact, you know, I sometimes view a transaction as just, okay, you gave me money, I gave you something for that money, and we're done. And you're not gonna come back to me until I offer you another good deal. That to me is a transaction, okay? Um, I think what you're describing uh, is, um, you're right, is, is the element of your, quote, transaction with that care provider, which is basically you know, the communication, um, the results of your test, the outcome of the doctor's um, conclusion about your health, all that stuff to me is, is part of it. It's part of it, you know. Um, I happen to think there's a lot of situations today where that's gotten a lot better. I mean, I mean there are some improvements there. A and I think, I, I remember I had a doctor a number of years ago, you know, when I told him I worked at Nordstrom, he says, hey, can I ask you a couple questions about service because we're not very good at it, you know? And so there was a recognition that there's an opportunity there. But you know, you know the challenge is we're, we're all gonna have to work collectively and stay the course for a long time. I mean, if the word persistence is ever gonna be necessary in, in, in making change here, it's gonna be with all caps and bold <laughs> and a 50 font. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, Mike, I thank you too. Uh, we uh, we all came in here knowing that our innovations had to uh, improve health and save money, and get funded and mm -hmm. all the other things that we had on our to-do list. And now you've told us that we need to think about the customer beneficiaries of our innovations because the world's going to tilt in that direction. And um, one way you've uh, made our life harder. But in another way, you've told us what we really need to hear. Uh, because if, if this is actually a, a path that healthcare needs to go toward more customer centricity, we need to hear that mm -hmm. and factor that in. So thank you. Well, thank you, Lee. And uh, I'm going to assure the group now that they can share in these refreshments and get the answer about how to do it from you over a glass of wine. Is that fair? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.